first time I went into Mosul, I was driving through East Mosul and then as we crossed the bridge into West Mosul, I was, it took my breath away. The, the amount of devastation, I've, I've visited many uh, post-conflict environments uh, ranging from Afghanistan into the Balkans throughout Africa and I, I don't think I've ever seen a, a part of a city that was so pulverized. It, it was very reminiscent of, of images of the Second World War, of, of Stalingrad, of, of Hamburg, Coventry, you know, completely blown apart. Mosul is a, a city in northern Iraq. It lies between um, Erbil and, and the Syrian border. And when ISIS was at the, the peak of its control, um, there were over two million people living in Mosul. Um, it was the biggest city under ISIS control. As the city was surrounded, they fell back into, into defensive positions. They'd had two years to prepare these, and, and the majority of these were in the old city, so West Mosul, on the banks of the river. And um, these, these buildings had been booby-trapped. They'd been rigged with explosives. They had um, caches of ammunition and weapons for the fighters to use. Uh, the fighters were wearing suicide vests and prepared to fight to the end. And the coalition forces dropped a lot of ordnance on them. And so the, the explosive hazard and the explosive contamination in Mosul is, is unlike really anything I've seen before. So you would have buildings were collapsed in or on, on bodies. Some of the buildings had been booby-trapped or, or rigged with explosives to stop people returning home. And then there was the unexploded ordnance from, from just the actual fighting. When you look at that level of devastation, you know, people just can't get back to their homes. They, they're, they're finding it very difficult. You know, the, the fridge might have been booby-trapped, so if you open the fridge door, it goes off, or a light switch gets flicked, and there's a bomb waiting for you. On top of the different explosive hazards, um, a lot of the buildings are very unstable. So, you know, if, if when the teams are clearing, they were to move the wrong piece of rubble, um, the whole building could collapse on them. So it's just a, a, a really difficult and challenging environment. So people will continue to not be able to return to their homes or rebuild their homes until the explosive hazard has been cleared. The actual searchers, the guys who are doing a lot of the, the grunt work, who are on the ground on their hands and knees, they're Iraqis. They're the real unsung heroes. You know, going out and, and finding out where where items are. Often items are, are brought in by people who found them in their homes or found them in their gardens and they, they bring them to our team sites and then our, our, our teams work to destroy these items. But also then looking at some of the new technology like drones and being able to you know, put a drone over a site and look to see what the ha potential hazard is and, and seeing things from different perspectives and, and looking at are there obvious threats? You know, can we see an explosive device that is visible? Can we see indicators that an explosive device might have been laid? Can we look at different avenues of approach and to be able to see where we can provide the most benefit? And if you want people to go home, you have to create, create an environment that they feel safe. And that's not just their home being removed of explosive hazards, but it's allowing them to have access to clean water, to electricity, for the schools to be cleared so that their children can go back to school, so that health posts can be cleared, so they can be refurbished, so that hospitals are safe, so that you know, doctors can start having you know, procedures and surgery. And a lot of the work we've been doing has been working to ensure that we prioritise the tasking we do that has the most impact. So if we clear a, a water treatment plant that's going to provide 250,000 people a day with clean water, or we clear a bridge so it can be repaired and a thousand vehicles an hour can cross it, you know, what will give the most impact? What will give us real value add to the work we do? And it was incredible when I was in Mosul to see how quickly families would go back into the rubble of West Mosul and relay their foundations and start building their homes again. I mean, really incredible to see how proud they are and how they want to get on with their lives. You know, they've gone through a, a terrible conflict um, and they're showing a resilience that is, is very inspirational. And we can help them by removing explosive hazards. Then people can feel confident and they can start getting on with their lives.